good morning, everybody, and a special welcome to our primary audience, the Chuan University of Technology. Today, Share Screen Africa welcomes you all to our series, African Geology and Swirls. Now, my name is Aisha, and my co-host today is Prudence, who will be handling the Q&A session. Just for some background, the Big Bang occurred more than 14 billion years ago. There was hydrogen, some helium, and a little bit of lithium. Today, there are nearly 100 known naturally occurring elements with hundreds of variants. In our solar system, the inner planets are closer to the sun and smaller and rockier, while the outer planets are further away and larger, mostly made up of gas. Now here are some fun facts. Saturn was named after the Roman deity for agriculture. Jupiter was named after the Royal Roman deity. And Venus was named after the Roman deity of love and beauty. Our planet, however, the blue planet, and the only planet known to have water was named planet Earth. And the name has an old English and Germanic origin which corresponds to both ground, soil, dirt, country, as well as the abode of man or the material world. Our speaker today, Mr. Daniel Furi, knows all about soil. After graduating from the University of Pretoria with a degree in biochemistry and molecular biology, he went on to be a farm technology intern at ZZ2 Farms, where he gained skills in compost making, organic pest control technology, amongst other things. He was also an organic waste supervisor at Oracle Environmental Services, where he found creative and innovative solutions for diverting waste from a landfill site. Daniel is currently a regenerative agriculture support at Grounded and does microbiology testing of agriculture soils to determine soil health and productivity at SFTC. And with that, I hand over to you, Daniel. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, everyone, for having me today and uh, allowing me to attend. Uh, so a small disclaimer, I'm not a lecturer. I'm going to uh, share with you guys my practical experience from working in the field uh, rather. So I'm, I'm going to try and make it a little bit more uh, practical orientated. Um, for Grounded, currently we work a lot with smallholder farmers. So my, my role is often training smallholder farmers and making scientific concepts like soil biology more accessible uh, to a farmer so that they can understand it and hopefully apply it to their soils. I'm going to start off with one of my favorite quotes. Um, that This is Franklin D. Roosevelt. He was one of the first American presidents. Um, he said that the nation that destroys its soil destroys itself. And it's... At this stage in commercial agriculture, um, we are we are approaching a, a point where we are now destroying our soils um, very rapidly, and its agriculture has become very unsustainable. Um, so, I work for a company called Grounded. Um, we're based in South Africa with colleagues in the Netherlands, and we work throughout Southern and Eastern Africa. It's a small team of people. Um, it's a, it's, a, it's a, a lean startup at this stage, um, but all very passionate and professional people working together. And our mission is to scale regenerative agriculture in Africa. Um, we do this by investing in operating companies. Um, we've got three operating current uh, companies currently, one in South Africa, um, one in Zambia that I'll talk to you guys about today, and one in Tanzania. And we these these operating companies are agricultural processes and aggregators, and they work with groups of farmers around them to, to bring in the raw material, process and aggregate it. And then in a lot of cases, we export the materials uh, to European markets or to international markets. But our, our focus then is to support the smallholder farmers um, that we source the raw materials from 
to farm more sustainably. Um, and we do this by focusing on four key areas, which is to amplify the biodiversity on the farms. So we do a lot of agroecological approaches. We aim for climate smart farming. So preserving water is an essential part of this. Restoring soil fertility. And that I think is going to, we're going to deep dive deeper into that in the, uh, in the next three series. And then we do this to climate uh, combat climate change. Um, a lot of these smallholder farmers that we work with are in very climate sensitive areas. Um, and I'll go into Zambia as an example now in the southern province. And these guys don't have the infrastructure, big irrigation systems and uh, greenhouses and these types of technologies available to them to to survive drastic climate um, shifts. So we have, to, we have to work with what they do have, which is uh, the soil and the plants, um, and try and improve their climate resilience. Um, so Grounded has established its own um, regenerative farm in the southern province of Zambia. Uh, we call it the Grounded Similaha IFC. Um, it's IFC stands for Incubator Farm Company. Um, this is a very radically new model that we are trialing. Um, and we've we've been doing our prototype for the last two years and are now uh, at the stage where we are starting to scale up. Um, so to give you an idea, Zuni Farm is situated in the southern province of Zambia. Um, it's uh, it's at a critical border between Botswana, uh, Zimbabwe, and Namibia, uh, where all four countries come together. Um, it's it's at a, a border crossing called the Kazungula Bridge, um, which is a direct border crossing and links um, Botswana, Namibia, and Zambia together. So strategically, it's a, a key position um, that links several of these Southern African countries together. Um, there, we've gone into a long-term lease agreement with uh, the, uh, the tribal, um, the, the village Kazuni, and have secured a piece of land over there uh, that's just under 90 hectares in size. Um, the, the farm is split into four groups, if you can put it, uh, call it that way. Um, and the, the bottom of the farm uh, section here where the farm thins down is borders on the Zambezi River. So it's the Zambezi is um, at that point is approximately one kilometer wide. It's a, a massive river at that point. It's um, and the bottom section of our farm actually falls within the floodplain. Short term, we are pumping um, water from boreholes and we are farming just on the upper farm section because these bottom soils um, are very heavy soils that high in clay content, high in sodium content, because this is an ancient floodplain system. So we cannot farm those soils. Um, the upper farm and the top farm sections are Kalahari sand. Um, so they they're part of the Kalahari bushveld complex. And so they are red sand soils, very nutrient poor soils. Um, uh, but at least they, they are easier to farm because they are lower sodium content. So what we have done at the IFC farm is we took this, this upper farm section and we split it into uh, production blocks, which are approximately half a hectare, 100 meters by 40 meters. And we've got vegetable beds on either side, an agroforestry strip on the center. And then each block is surrounded by a buffer zone of approximately six meters of natural vegetation. This is what we call our base production block. Um, and the farmers are taught, uh, we, we train farmers to take on one of these production blocks, farm it very intensively, and, um, and then we they we go into a profit share so that that's what the incubator farm model is about um there's a many smallholder farmers surrounding us um at in that area the kazuni village and then mambova village uh towards the south and kazungula village on uh towards the 
the north of, um, of our farm. And these smallholder farmers have many challenges um, to farm in that area. So one of the biggest uh, factors for them is a lack of access to irrigation water. Although the river is close by, um, you saw on our farm, uh, our farm borders on the on the river over here. This lower section of of the uh, of the land is not easily farmable because of the uh, clay content and the sodium content in the soils. So realistically, farmers have to farm. It's about two kilometers away from the river. So they very few farmers can actually pump water from the river up to that point. And because of the the dry season, um, these there's only they've got a monsoon season from about starts in about November a little bit and then December, January, February, March. So there's a very short window that they can actually grow any grains, rain fed grains in. And most of them then prioritize to grow maize in that in that window. Then there's other challenges that the farmers face, like a lack of mechanization. They lack critical skills. They there's a lot of wildlife conflicts. So that Mombova area is a, a very important uh, elephant corridor for elephants crossing from Namibia uh, into Zambia uh, and into the Simalaha uh, wilderness area. And we started this farm as a, in partnership with a, comp, uh, with a conservation agency called Peace Parks. And they, they were focused on the Simalaha area. And they were focused on conserving the Simalaha um, wilderness area, but they needed to develop uh, a model to to support the smallholder farmers um, in that area, so that there wouldn't be this wildlife human conflict. And so they've asked us to develop a model, and our solution was to aggregate smallholder farmers into a small area, provide them with inputs. Uh, we provide them with mechanization. We provide them with irrigation. They farm their production block under guidance from we've got our own management team and agronomists on site. And then in turn, we do a profit share on sales. So just to give you guys a background of the company and where, where we're working. So today I was asked to talk a little bit about soil biology and I, I really like that little intro video of the stars and the um, the planets and the initial formation of the planets. Now those the earth when it initially formed was just a dead rock um, and soil biology is the key to converting dead rock into living soil. Um, so I'll, I'll give you guys a very high level overview of soil biology and then share with you some of the practical tools that we use uh, when we're working with our farmers and then give you guys a brief look at some of the effects of, um, of the biological farming practices. This image here is it's a, it's a famous image that um, was developed in the USDA by the USDA in the 1960s. Uh, one of the um, professors there was Dr. Elaine Ingham, uh, one of the champions of soil microbiology. And this soil food web gives a very simplified overview of the different groups of microorganisms. Soil biology is often um, referred to as um, soil microbiology. Um, because you've got different levels, they call it trophic levels. So when plant matter decays, um, then you've got the first trophic level, which is the, the, uh, the first feeding level called the primary decomposers. Um, then you've got the second trophic level of predators, and then you've got the, uh, the higher um, insects and third and fourth trophic levels. Very much like above the ground, you would have plants as your primary um, source of energy, and then you would have uh, gazelle, and then leopard, and then lion, and so you would go through this um, food web. And exactly the same thing happens under the ground. So the primary decomposers are uh, fungi and bacteria, and these are the core 
of um, a healthy soil. Uh, so here you can see on the left hand side, this is some wood chip in a compost pile and there's these fine white hairs. Those hairs are fungal mycelium. And on the right hand side here, you can see this is a microscope image at 400 times normal magnification of uh, fungal mycelium. And then all these little black dots um, you see around that, those are bacteria. And fungi and bacteria, they take detritus, which is dead plant material um, that's, uh, you know, leaves and roots that um, the plant dies and leaves on the ground. And they break that down and they create a humus. And that's these big dark blocks over here. So these are stabilized um, particles of organic matter. That and in breaking that down, they release uh, nutrients um, that plants will be able to take up. So the soil microbes have multiple important functions. Um, they feed plants indirectly through nutrient cycling, like I explained, um, breaking down the organic matter from previous plants. They also feed plants directly. There's a thing called rhizophagy. And it's a very interesting process where plants will actually eat bacteria. So the plants uh, secrete sugars at the growing tip. The bacteria come closer to try and utilize those sugars and the plant actually absorbs the bacteria into its growing tip, uh, takes off its um, cell membrane uh, takes the nutrients out of the bacteria, puts back together the cell membrane and spits the bacteria out. Um, I think about 30% of the bacteria survive the process. Um, but that's one way that plants indirectly feed uh, or directly feed on um, bacteria. Plants also have symbiotic relationships with soil microorganisms. So mycorrhiza are a, a group of fungi that live inside of the plant roots um, or they half in half out and they greatly increase the plant's root surface area something like 800 um, percent and the mycorrhiza and those fungi they're very very small and fine so they can get into the small soil particles and mycorrhiza especially um, secretes an organic acid um, that then breaks down uh, insoluble phosphorus in the ground and they give that to the plant. And it's a symbiotic relationship because the plants feed them sugars uh, that they produce from their leaves in exchange. A rhizobium is another group. Um, these are soil bacteria that fix nitrogen um, that live in the nodules. And all of this happens in this area called the rhizobiome. So yeah, you can see that on the plant roots, it's we, we call them dreadlocks, um, but it's a, it's a sheath of bacteria that are clinging to the plant's roots. And you can see it looks, they look like little dreadlocks. And a healthy biological soil would look like that. Microbes do other things as well. They secrete plant growth, promoting hormones and other growth stimulating molecules. They create a healthy ecosystem that outcompetes disease causing organisms. Because obviously these microbes are reliant on the plants for sugars. So they they try and protect the plants and get the plants growing as healthy as possible. And then lastly, these microbes also create soil. So they create the soil structure, they break down the organic matter, they dissolve the, um, the rock, uh, the, the parent material um, and make those nutrients soluble. They increase water holding capacity and something that people don't realize is they actually exhale carbon dioxide. So microbes are constantly breathing out carbon dioxide and when they're very active they're breathing out more carbon dioxide and plants obviously need carbon dioxide to create uh, glucose in photosynthesis so it's another critical role of soil microorganisms i hope it gives you guys a very brief uh, idea of soil biology and then I can just go into some of the practical tools that we work um, with farmers to improve soil biology. The IFC is a, is a mixed vegetable farm and we are focused solely on organic farming. Um, so we follow just organic principles um, in the farming. It's not per se that we are organic certified. It's just what we are trying to promote is organic and natural farming practices with the farmers that we work with. Um, and we 
we we encourage farmers to use materials that are readily available all around them. So chemical fertilizers are um, they they have their purpose. They're excellent at um, feeding plants a quick boost of nutrients, but at the same time, they're very expensive, especially if you look at a landlocked country like Zambia that's solely reliant on imports. When the exchange rate starts to get difficult, like what it currently is between the US dollar and the kwacha, the the chemical fertilizers become immeasurably uh, expensive. And this is I think there's been an increase in the price of chemical fertilizers of about 300 percent over the last um, uh, over the last year, two years with this Russian Ukraine war. And so, Farmers are struggling more and more to feed their crops. And as a result, their soil is degrading and their crop yields are coming down. Uh, we promote composting with our farmers. So there's a lot of cow manure. Um, most of the farmers around us are actually pastoralists. So they're grazing their cattle up and down the Zambezi River. So, and they crawl their cattle every evening uh, for safety. So there's there's a lot of cattle manure that's being accumulated uh, in these crawls, and we use that as a as a primary source of nutrition on our farm. Um, compost, if if it's made well, it's got an excellent diversity of microorganisms, and you also you have a lot of soluble nutrients that are available for the plants as well, and you put down a lot of organic matter um, when you're using compost as well. Um, so we we make compost primarily from cattle manure, a little bit of chicken manure brought in from broilers, chicken production, and then a lot of green waste or green manures that we grow on our own farm, as well as plant residues that we use to make our composts. Another thing that we focus on a lot with the farmers is actually making more specialized organic fertilizers. Um, we mainly focus on fermentation. So fermentation is an ancient Korean technology. So it comes from the East and um, we use something called effective microorganisms. It's a, essentially, it's a broad group of lactobacillus, yeasts, and um, some, some different molds that together break down very effectively in an anaerobic conditions. They break down high nutrient, um, high nutrient content, materials. Uh, we use fish, uh, fish offal. Um, Zambia, next to the Zambezi, is obviously a very good um, fish farming area. And there's a large uh, tilapia growing industry around there. So we take the offal from the tilapias, we ferment them down, we call it fermented fish, uh, very creatively. And that makes an excellent liquid um, plant food that's already packed with all the nutrients, uh, high in nitrogen, high in phosphorus, and then it's got all these beneficial microorganisms in it as well. Then we we focus on creating a supportive environment for the microorganisms as well. So we we our goal is to include increase soil carbon content through incorporating um, woody or let's say biomass material. Um, we do a lot of mulching, we work the plant residues back into the soil. Um, but one of the methods that we've done very effectively is using, uh, producing and using biochar. So the area that we started farming on was degraded land. It was a mostly Mupani shrub, um, so small Mupani trees coming up. And we had to clear out the fields, um, the production blocks. And all of that material, all the mupani shrub and bush that we cleared off of the ground, we burned that into biochar. Um, biochar is a type of charcoal that's produced at a high temperature and then quenched with water. Um, that's a very effective way to store carbon very long term. Uh, in Brazil, they say that the ancient Aztecs, they used biochar um, to build very rich soils. They call it Petra Terra, black soil. Um, and biochar has got a very interesting structure. It's a porous, uh, so like a sponge, um, because obviously it's that uh, that xylem, uh, those tubes of the uh, wood, 
that have been burnt out and then when you quench it with water it's you create steam and it almost pops open like that uh, and biochar has the ability to absorb nutrients um so where you often leach out nitrogen and potassium from your soils the biochar absorbs those nutrients and then through microbial action then releases those nutrients back so something like a mycorrhiza would move into that biochar into those pores and take those nutrients out then and it's you create a battery in your soil essentially and at the same time it's it's like a, a high-rise condo for uh, for these soil microorganisms they love living uh, within this biochar structure so by adding these this organic matter we create a home and we put the source the food source in for the for the microbes and then one of the critical things is that we increase plant microbe interactions. Um, our policy at the IFC is to never leave the so soil bare. Um, it happened a little bit when we were starting off, but our crop rotation, we rotate two cash crops. So let's say tomatoes, then maize, and then we use a cover crop uh, in our rotation. We never fallow ground and we never leave it bare uh, without any living crops in it. Uh, for for longer than a, a a week or two between crop rotations uh, when we when we turn over beds plants feed microorganisms um it's critically important to understand that and microorganisms feed plants it's a it's a very symbiotic relationship the microbes uh, free nutrients in the soil they feed those nutrients to the plants and the plants um uh, create sugars in their leaves and proteins and fats, and they feed that down into the uh, to the microorganisms. So there's a constant exchange between the two. And if you leave a piece of land bare without any plants growing there, all the microorganisms are going to go dormant eventually because they need living plants to to function. And so we this is our policy is to constantly be growing a, a very diverse cover crop. Here you can see Munga, uh, our farm foreman, and I mean he's six foot three or something like that and you can see he he's struggling to reach the the tops of those cover crops we we use multi-species so things like sun hemp um sunflowers millets um sorghums uh buckwheat a, a range of different uh, cover crops and we'll then work these cover crops into the ground um and the the that all that organic matter all that green uh, we call it the green manure steadily decreases the need for additional fertilization so we we decrease our need for um adding manures and um because we are growing a lot of the food in place and through those symbiotic relationships with the soil biology the mycorrhiza that are busy solubilizing phosphorus and potassium the rhizobium that are growing on the roots of the legume crops um, busy uh, creating proteins and nit fixing nitrogen and creating proteins you can actually build up um, your soil nutrition in place and this is a it's a critical concept it's why in nature you never see fertilizer being added all natural systems um uh, from the Brazil, from the rainforest to the fainbos to um, the grass, uh, the grasslands and the um, the free state, all of them are designed so that they feed themselves. There's there's no additional fertilizer that anyone brings into these systems. Um, the dead plant material falls on the ground, gets broken down by microorganisms, gets cycled back into living plant material, and we as humans can use that those natural processes to to then grow food obviously we do take a, some food away so we do take some biomass away from uh, in, in the form of crops and um, so it's not perfect you won't um be able to in some cases you might be able to especially with uh, with livestock integration but in most cases you will still have to put a little bit in but if you make use of the biological processes that are already existing, the amount that you have to add to the soil becomes less and less and less as you build up the soil's organic matter reserves and that, that soil microbial diversity. So a last 
technique that we use to enhance the biological farming is through the use of compost extracts. Um, it's essentially, we make a tea out of compost, um, which is you just soak the compost in some bubbling water and then you spray it on the ground. That's you create an inoculum. So these microorganisms are tiny microscopic um, uh, creatures. And if you spray them out, then they start to multiply very rapidly and you can increase the diversity and activity of your microorganisms through inoculation like this. So at the IFC, we've we've been going, like I said, for about two years. Um, we broke ground towards the end of 2021. So it's, maybe it's a year and a, and a bit. And we've gone through several, we've, I think about four crop cycles now. Um, that's, that we've, we've got the four cash crops that have gone th uh, gone through the cycle. We, we're approaching the fourth cash crop cycle now. And then in between those, every two cash crops, we put a cover crop in. Like I showed you guys the picture of Munga there. And we've been measuring our soil organic matter content. We started at about 1.5% soil organic matter, which is it's very low, but it's it's actually the the average for sandy soils um, in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and we've built up rapidly over the last year and a half, almost 2% soil organic matter um, in our four production blocks. Um, you can see we, we're approaching almost 4% soil organic matter in, in the one block. And we've achieved this through this intensive biological farming method. Um, that it, it means that we've stored approximately 37 tons of carbon per hectare. So pure carbon per hectare that we've stored back into the soil. Um, and obviously all of that organic matter has, has nutrients linked to that nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, that those microorganisms can then cycle back to the plants. And the, the whole point with biological farming is that you create a battery in your soil that, that slow releases nutrients all the time. Then. So you get healthy crops that are well fed at all times. Um, we've seen very rapid improvements in soil structure. Um, we've gone from, like I said, a Kalahari sand, a very poor um, Kalahari sand, to well aggregated soils. And it improves our water holding capacity and our nutrient exchange capacity. And like I said at the start, we're focused on climate smart farming. So by decreasing the amount of irrigation water we have to put down to get the same yields, by decreasing the amount of fer uh, fertility we have to add to the soils, we improve the climate resilience of the smallholder farmers that we work with. And we are still achieving yields that are comparable to commercial yields. It, it was difficult um, in the first year, especially we, we were struggling with, um, with low yields. But as we approach this threshold, they say about three and a half percent soil organic matter is, is the threshold point where that, that soil's natural process starts to kick in. Um, and starts to work properly. And, and now we're starting to see that we can easily achieve the same commercial yields and we are fertilizing about 60% of the recommended um, nutrients compared to uh, if you were doing it chemically. So we, 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 we fertilize 40% less and it's all organic fertilizers and we're still achieving comparable yields to uh, commercial systems, um, healthy crops. Uh, we've still got a few pest issues that we are starting, uh, still figuring out, you know, farming in a new area, you always have new bugs that you need to learn to know. But we, are, we, we see that this system is now starting to, to really work and, and turn over the nutrients and give the plants what they need so that the plants can grow healthy. So I hope this talk gave you it's just an, a fair idea of soil biology, of that living component of this of the soil, uh, the microorganisms that break down the parent rock and turn it into soil that can feed plants. Um, and I hope it gives you guys an idea of some of the, the tools that you can use in biological farming. Um, 
and then yeah to just see what what's possible with biological farming um it's something when i started my journey um in my career i worked for zz2 um a big tomato farm up in the northern part of um south africa and they saw over time they they a massive farm they saw over time the intensive chemical farming processes weren't they were the yields were steadily decreasing uh, instead of increasing the pests and disease pressure was increasing and they decided to move things over um to what they called natir budere which is nature nature farming and follow a biological farming process and i think they do about 8000 hectares of tomatoes and something like 3000 hectares of avocado so it's not a a funny practice that's for a select few organic farmers it's a it's a good uh practice that can be adopted by the largest farmers and um to mimic natural processes to improve the sustainability of your farming systems thank you very much uh, for your time and yeah the floor is then open for questions i'd like yes. to say thank you for your very informative talk uh, as a child of subsistence farmers it's very nice to see the science behind the soil and regenerative farming um, and thank you for representing tax because that's my alma mater. Um, I'd like to open the floor for any questions. You can lift up your virtual hand. You can put it in the chat and I'll read it out loud. I actually have a question. First of all, Daniel, I'd just like to say thank you so much. That was really, really interesting. Um, Daniel, I'm just wondering that I know that um, we've been doing a little bit of research in conservation agriculture for a potential series for share screen and sort of one of the things the issues that we've come up with is is um if you're a farmer that's looking to suddenly to change into these more regenerative techniques there is a certain period of time that it takes for your soils to build up and like you said until you start seeing the results um and what would you say or how do you navigate around the issue that it brings up of not being able to get your yield in during those years how do you, you support yourself financially um it's a very good question um there is definitely a transition period that you go through for biological farming because you um so we did it from scratch in the in zambia we, we started with degraded soils and it's taken us a year and a half to get to a stage where we're actually starting to see profitable production blocks um which is obviously but we came in with investment funding to to get started and we understood there was going to be this transition gap that we would have to go through or a commercial farmer who's currently operational and sort of just doing well enough we i usually work with farmers on a on a slower transition um the chemical fertilizers they damage your soil biology and they degrade degrade the carbon in your soil but uh, and they unfortunately they they like uh, drugs often people refer uh, you know compare it to something like heroin where you need to keep adding that chemical fertilizer otherwise you completely drop all yields um there's no bank account and so i work with farmers to slow that transition down so gradually decrease the um the chemical fertilizer usage change some of the practices that are the most detrimental like intensive plowing going slowly over to no-till and then to actively inoculate with soil biology some composts using compost and compost teas and you that you're going to go through that dip um but instead of doing that over two years in and losing a lot of yield um i think people can lose between 30 to 50 percent yield before they back up there you spread that over a longer time period five to seven years where you you slowly transition to a biological farming system um it's it's one of those things people have to realize you have to build up your soil organic matter and your your soil biology that the diversity and the amount of biology to a point where it can sustain that uh, that different way of farming that that biological system so yeah slow the transition down wean yourself off of the drugs and um don't go cold turkey otherwise it it hurts a lot um unless you have enough money to survive that <laughs>
Great, thank you so much. Um, and I, I just had another question. I know you mentioned a lot about how livestock um, can be used in these kind of systems. Um, and you mentioned about the fish guts, which is really interesting. Is there any other way? Um, I know that I've seen things before where you, you have, um, it's kind of like the aquaponic system where you use the wastewater from the fish with the fertilizer then to add to your crops. Is there any, do you incorporate that in any way? So we're busy um, adding a chicken component. So we, we're busy looking at bringing uh, layer chickens in and those sections of the production blocks where we have cover crops in at, a t at the time that we'd actually run those uh, chickens free range over that. Um, because it's, it's difficult in an intensive vegetable cropping situation to bring uh, grazing animals like um, cattle and goats and things like that in. Um, but we're, we're trying, it's, the, it's called agroecology. We're trying to develop an ecological system. And for us, the, there's a niche to put chickens in. And then, you know, the fish farming is also another way that we actually, when we put in our, our large irrigation system, we'll have several holding dams for the water and that we'll actually farm tilapias in those holding dams as well so that their waste water um, feeds through the irrigation would still feed the crops as well. So it, it's about finding the right kind of animal to fit your specific situation. If you were um, doing maize, uh, dry land maize, for instance, then you can very easily graze cattle as a as a, a livestock after you take the maize off or something like that. So each farm is a little bit different in how you integrate animals, but animal integration is a critical part of biological farming. Uh, animals are like microbe factories. They they um, they manure spreads microorganisms. They their stomachs, especially ruminants, are packed full of uh, these lactobacillus, these fermentation bacteria, and they manure spreads these, they, they inoculate the soil wherever they go, um, through their, their gut and also through their mouths, saliva that they, when they bend down to graze, then they're putting down those microorganisms. So the compost tea tries to replicate that in a way, but livestock are an integral part of a natural ecology. And then, sorry, I'm I'm asking all the questions. Um, uh, and then would they also contribute a little bit to maybe some pest control? I know that ducks are really good for eating slugs and things. Uh, yeah, yes, you you can use ducks in. So, for instance, the vineyard farmers in the um, in Cape Town, uh, there's there's a few of them that are very uh, effectively using ducks. Um, uh, chickens, uh, you don't want to put them between your veggies because they'll eat your veggies rather than the insects. Yeah. Um, they, they're a little bit distractive. But there, there are places where it's appropriate to use uh, livestock or animals as, as natural pest control. So we, we put these natural buffer zones. So we just left the bush around the production blocks to try and encourage bird life and create a, a habitat for birds around, the, around our production blocks so that they can come in and um, take the pests. Uh, unfortunately, you also you get um, some birds that come and eat the maize, but you know we deal with them as well and uh, we, we just cover our maize. Um, but so you, you need to cre create an ecosystem or mimic the ecosystem to, to bring that, that function of the predators um, back in to control the pest populations. Um, yeah. Great, thank you for all of that. Just a pleasure. The... Um, Daniel, I just wanted to ask in terms of um, just regenerative agriculture, do you use particular kinds of seeds or you use the normal GMO seeds? So Zambia, it's illegal to, um, GMOs aren't legal in Zambia. So as a, as a first point, um, but there's, there's, so there's a difference between hybrid seeds and op open pollinated seed. Um, so hybrid seed is what you typically are buying from the seed companies these days uh, where they've crossed two lines and they get a first generation F1 cross. And But if you try to save seed from that hybrid, then you, you won't get the same uh, what they call true to type. So the plant won't produce in the same way. Hybrid seed are very effective because they're very high yielding. 
um, and they they bred for very specific traits like some pest and disease resistance. And we use a lot of hybrid seed, but we're also trialing open pollinated seed because working with a lot of the smallholders around us, the the ideal is that we we develop our own strains, our own genetics that those farmers can save the seeds from uh, and use for themselves. Um, because the, the, the concept behind the IFC farm is to create a closed gate farm where we don't bring any inputs into that farm. Once, once it's working like it optimally should, all the fertility should come from the farm itself, from our livestock and from the green manures that we're growing on the farm. And ideally the seed inputs we can save our own seeds as well so that's a that's an ideal situation but if if you go back 100 years all farmers operated like that they they maybe didn't have as high yields as what we have today but they they worked on closed farm systems where they didn't bring in excessive amounts of stuff from somewhere else and that creates in today's day and age it creates long-term resilience because you're not dependent on these global supply chains to bring yeah. uh, nitrogen urea from Russia or um, uh, potash from Canada. Um, so you, you can create your own internal resilience like that. Yeah. Um, just a second question. Do you, from your experience and the work you've done, do you find that it's easier to get um, smaller scale farmers to transition to regenerative farming? Or do you find that uh, bigger commercial farms are more willing and because uh, I've seen, like from my experience, I've seen more people who do subsistence farming move more into, um, what is it called, into fertilizers in the last like five years, you know, mm. uh, because of the droughts and because the yields are, years, are, are less now. But I wonder if like from your experience, is it better to get like smaller scale farmers to transition into that or does it seem to be more, is there a bigger willingness from corporate farmers? Um. It's a tough question. <laughs> so uh, some of the farmers we work with, some of the small farmer, small older farmers, uh, especially in East Africa, they, you can say they organic by, by design. Oh, uh, they, 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 they don't have access to fertilizers. So they, they farm organically in any case, um, not always very well, but they, they generally farm organically. And for them, it's quite easy because you give them a couple of tips on on how to tweak their system so that it works well, and they then they adopt it very quickly. Other farmers have, especially you know, in some southern African countries, have been heavily influenced by the fertilizer companies, um, which have you know really sold fertilizer hard to these guys because um, that is the biggest market. Um, there's hundreds of thousands of smallholder farmers compared to a couple of thousand commercial farmers. So these fertilizer companies are really pushing this hard. And these guys don't understand. It's it's a, a question of education. So you need to do a lot of intensive education with them. And it's difficult to reach so many farmers. So um, in Tanzania, for instance, we work with 3,000 smallholder farmers that we source spices from. So just sheer volume of people it's difficult to reach all of those people. So those are some of the challenges, but in my experience, they are far more open to an, a more natural way of farming. So all the Zambians, for instance, they like the organic farming. They they believe that the organic produce tastes better. They, they see what the damage is that the commercial, um, the chemicals are doing to their soils. So they are far more eager to adopt it, but they need you know they need a, a resilient system that doesn't that still produces the yields, and then the commercial farmers. There's some old school ones that just don't want to change at all, but a lot of the, especially some of the younger commercial farmers that I work with, are very aware that the marketplaces they are selling into a lot of them are export farmers, so avos or citrus or something like that. Their marketplace in Europe or North America is demanding cleaner food, if I can put it that way, which is free of fertilizers and um, and pesticides. So they're very eager to, to learn about it. And there's a lot of being written about regenerative practices, but they much more, let's say, careful in going through the transition because there's a lot at risk for them, I think, um, 
a lot of smallholder farmers are subsidized through other income streams where these big commercial farmers it's all or nothing for them kind of thing so they're a lot more cautious if uh, risk averse but yeah uh, long there's answer. a question from the question from the chat and i think you answered it partially but maybe you could elaborate it a little bit more uh baba lo says um she once heard of tilling in agriculture do you know how this practice affects soil biology uh yes so Tillage is where you turn over the soil, um, you break up the soil and um, you incorporate air into it. And mm -hmm. tillage, there's, there's multiple forms of tillage. So right at the beginning, they, they used to do something called plowing, um, which is a, they use a, a specific tool called a moldboard plow, which takes the soil and then essentially flips it upside down. So they take the subsoil, they change it and they 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 literally flip that top set 30, 40 centimeters of soil upside down, which is a very destructive practice because all of the soil organic matter and biology is in the top 10 to 15 centimeters of that soil. So if you're going to put that soil 15 centimeter, uh, 30 centimeters under, it goes anaerobic and it dies very quickly. So that destroyed soil structure. Um, but then other forms of tillage like um, very low, uh, shallow cultivation, um, rotivating the top layer of that soil can actually bring air into the, into the soil. So you need to be careful about what type of tillage you're performing. But in general, they say that every time you till your soil, you can lose up to 1% soil organic matter. So you need to know that you're detracting from your bank account. Um, you, you're taking a big... Um, withdraw from your soil carbon bank account every time you till the soil and the ideal is to move towards no-till but i've seen a lot of farmers you know if they if they practice it uh too hard then they can also run into trouble with no tillage so you, you have to find that balance between no till and till um if i can put it that way um just the last question. I don't know if you know the work being done by Kusa in, in Kenya, uh, but I'm wondering from what you said about like experience in Zambia um, and that there seems to be a gap in that there's a need maybe for some kind of conservation agriculture education. Do you think that there is a gap for that? Like people need to be to be done some initial maybe, um, I don't know, orientation to what conservation agriculture is before they actually uptake it? Yeah, I, I think there's there's a a huge knowledge gap, um, and there's many organisations. I don't I don't know who's are directly in Kenya. Um, Michelle, my colleague, she's based in Kenya. She might know them. Um, but there are a lot of initiatives all over Africa to teach conservation agriculture and um, more biological farming practices. And but it's definitely something that's still there's still a huge gap for because like I said, there's just so many smallholder farmers and to reach these farmers um, and to educate them is, is one of the hardest things. And the fertilizer companies, they're obviously educating these farmers every time they walk into a cooperative and they're buying a bag of fertilizer. Then there's like brightly colored pamphlets and marketing materials and that successful farmer holding that giant cob of maize and, you know, people, it creates uh, aspiration, aspirational marketing. And these two little daily exposure for farmers doing conservation agriculture to see what the benefits are of that. So a lot of it is spread by word of mouth. You'll probably find one or two early adopters who have adopted a conservation approach and they're doing better, especially in difficult years when there's a drought or uh, floods or something like that. Um, but the, there's definitely more need for, I can say, marketing of, of this conservation agriculture uh, within in sub-Sahara Africa, or oh, southern and eastern Africa, uh, well, in Africa, I guess. Uh, thank you so much, Daniel. Like, I learned a lot today. It was a very informative talk. Everything was mind-blowing for me. And yes, we are reaching the end of the hour. I just want to extend on, you said Michelle knows more. And she will be speaking next week. Right, Sal? Yes, so we're looking forward to that talk.
No, so thank you very much from the Share Screen Africa team. Thank you to our right. speaker. Thank and you thank so you much, to the Daniel. Class. It's just a pleasure, guys. Um, and yeah, thank you for giving these opportunities to share some of the stories um, that we have from the industry side. And I, I hope that these at least gives you guys some food for, food for thought.